Hello, I'm Luke Darcy. Welcome to Access All Areas. Well, the best four teams of the year have got through to the prelim final, which is the way you would hope it was going to happen. And Damo, can't wait for Friday night to kick us off with Hawthorne and Geelong, one of the most anticipated finals I can remember. Yeah, Darcy, I agree, but I just felt the teams that had to play on the weekend just gone and get through to those prelim finals we see on the screen there, Geelong and Sydney. I just felt they're a, a rung below at least the teams they're going to be playing on the weekend. I know they both carry great clout and, and great quality of team by both Geelong and Sydney, but I reckon the matchups we've got, Hawthorne and Geelong and Fremantle Sydney, the teams that won the qualifying finals to me are a clear-cut favourite going to those games. Yeah, absolutely. The only caveat to me is just the Geelong hold over Hawthorne. Does it stand up in another final? That incredible record, if it gets close, is there something that's going to happen mentally? to the Hawks, uh, given that history since 2008. That's what makes that... I reckon it's more finished. So. I reckon Hawks will just win this game and, and, and yeah, easily. You're probably Six, right. seven goals. But the, you're probably right. The intrigue is there for me. Yeah. And there were a couple of Swans players, Dame, I thought were absolutely magnificent in the final. They were challenged last week and they stood up in great fashion. Jared McVeigh, we're told he wasn't able to train all week. The uh, skipper has come in and played one of the great finals performances. 42 touches. Uh, just below the record, 43 possessions. Dane Swan holds in a final. He had 20 in the second quarter. And at that stage, the game was genuinely up for grabs, mm. Damo. He was absolutely incredible. What is it about him, Darcy? He's just so unobtrusive, isn't he, the way he goes about his footy. And when, when this team surged in the mid-2000s, he wasn't part of the initial surge. He, he is getting better with every single game of footy he plays. Yeah, he just reminds me of, uh, of the great Swans players that uh, we've seen in the last 10 years. He's disciplined. He's got great uh, presence about him. He does the right things at the right time. And they've got another one on their hands who we know He's had a great year, Dan Hannery, yep. but uh, it was a really bad medial ligament strain. He, he lost a week for it, but it was probably a four-week injury. And then he struggled a bit last week against Isaac Smith a in lot. the first final. Yep. And uh, his performance, again, heavily tagged by Dennis Arnfield. He had 14 possessions to Arnfield's one halfway through the second half, uh, through, through the first half, I should say. He was great. It's willpower, Dust, isn't it, to, to do yep. what he did there? He's got bone bruising on, on that knee, and it's, it's quite a serious ailment. But he just willed himself, and you almost knew he was going to do it, given, as you say, the, the flacky cop for his lowly performance by his standards against Isaac Smith the week before. It was a weird matchup in itself, some people were saying, about him playing on Isaac Smith, but on the weekend, just gone right up in the top echelon of yeah. where he was for most of the first half of the Number season. Number one contested player on the ground he was. Now, the AFL didn't have a great night at ANZ Stadium, Damo, on a couple of uh, fronts. And the main one was the surface. This is an official uh, coming out or a groundskeeper coming out because this just happened, Damo. Every time players ran into this period, this patch of turf on the wing, the rugby league games were played there the day yeah. before. They had to high-pressure hose them down to get rid of the NRL signs. And it was really dangerous. I mean, how um, an ankle injury hasn't been done there is just pure luck rather than good fortune. Does, this is a massive issue for the AFL and they can't let it go away. This ground is not up to AFL standard the way they like to have AFL standard. There's a duty of care issue the AFL failed on on the weekend. There's a showcase spectacle that they failed on as well. This is a final of football, AFL style. Showcase game, bad look. They've got a scheduling issue. that They took the moral high ground when Subiaco Oval wasn't available for a particular um, date, they get all up on their high horse about that not being available. Well, when you've got a stadium that is available and it turns out in a condition like that, and, and worse, Dars, you've got the AFL chairman, Mike Fitzpatrick, whose company owns and runs the stadium. It's a really, really bad look. And, and I don't care about the conflict of interest people will say that he, he has on that. It's a serious issue when the head of the AFL is running a stadium that is not up to AFL standards. Yeah, the ground delivered in that sort of fashion on a big night for AFL football was just really poor. And I think uh, I understand the AFL Players Association have said, please explain the AFL's way, as they should, when you've got player safety issues. But the only uh, way they're going to do it, though, is if they say, you know what, this ground is not up to AFL standard before the game's played. And, and that would cause a, a catastrophe, I know, by way of scheduling. But that's the only way the yeah. message is going to get through. Score review, Damo, was interesting as well. We've got a big final, and you see uh, a couple of instances where you would have liked, in fact, uh, Chelsea Roth with the goal up by calls for the score review. Now, I like the fact we've got a camera on the score review, but <laughs> how about we move that camera to the goal line, Damo, and we can actually see well, there's the missing what camera. happened. There, there's the one. <laughs> see, how are you see. supposed to tell without a goal line camera? We can pay for a goal line camera, surely, by the time the finals come around. This is the second one too, Dust. Same thing. Again, the call looks right to the, the naked eye when it happens. So I think they've dodged a the bullet again there, the AFL. But it is. It's constant bullet dodging by not having 
the camera there. Oh, they have the rule in place, yeah. but the camera's in place, <laughs> particularly for a final. I mean, this, we, we are playing for, for cattle stations now, Dars. This is not a home and away game. This is the real stuff. Uh, have you seen Carlton's uh, list management demo? They've gone probably deeper into finals or even got into finals yeah. when we didn't think that was possible a few weeks ago. They have uh, highlighted that they're going to make severe changes. How drastic will they be? They'll be pretty drastic, Dars. I mean, the, the figure 10 we bandied around about six or eight weeks ago, that is still going to be the case. Are regardless of a where better they side demo this year under Mick Moldhouse than where last year under uh, Brett Ratton? They're a better side under Mick Moldhouse because it is Mick Moldhouse and it's not Brett Ratton. The actual list itself probably hasn't uh, changed too much, has it? I think players have developed and I think Bryce gives a really good example of that development. But Sean Hampson's the one, Darcy. He's contracted, but he will be used as currency at, at trade time. I want to get your thoughts on someone like a Yarren and, and a Betts. Yeah, look, I think uh, they've got too many of that type of player. Betts, Yarren and Jeff Garlett. Garlett's the one that's had the best year. Yarren's too talented a player to be playing the way he is at the moment. Sometimes you just have a, a conflict of uh, personality with a coach, so I wouldn't be surprised if they offer Yaron up and try and get something back in. For Thomas him. almost certainly comes in. Collingwood people, Collingwood people have basically put a line through Thomas on their list, and not only have they done that, they've actually gone one step further. They've got him on Carlton's list. That's Collingwood people thinking that's that deal's done. Okay, so he comes in. I want to move on to the coaching vacancies, Damon. I know you're full bottle on this. There are three jobs up for grab senior coaching positions. So let's start with the S and one for the 12 months fill-in role. Any idea on that? No, they're still in two minds. They haven't even got a strategy around whether they replace James Hurd with an Essendon type person or they go outside. I still feel they're leaning more strongly toward the non-Essendon person. That creates its own dramas in, in itself, doesn't it? Um, we'll go to Brisbane too. There's four really good candidates there. Tudor and Lepich interviewed last week really well and Craig and Simpson had done that previously. Tudor's the interesting one. He's involved in those talks with Essendon as well now. He's also a front, a front runner for the Brisbane Lions vacancy. Scotty Burns in the mix big time along with Peter Sumich for the West Coast job, but there's some strong talk out of, out of Perth late last week that the 2IC role under Paul Ruse at Melbourne may appeal more to Scott Burns, strangely enough, than, than the actual West Coast job itself. Learning under Ruse is something that he's giving serious consideration to as we speak. One name you didn't mention there was Simon Goodwin. Uh, I understand he's interviewed as well at Brisbane and has to be in the running for the Essendon job. Uh, I don't know what Brisbane's doing interviewing him, Darcy, and, and, I, and I know this sounds a little bit harsh, but he has got to now go away from Essendon and just go and do some assistant coaching elsewhere for at least two years. He's tarnished whether he likes it or not with what happened at Essendon. Now, I know he wasn't found guilty by anything under the AFL rules, but his name is linked indelibly with that whole saga and he just needs to get a break. And I've got no idea how Brisbane can think sacking Michael Voss and interviewing Simon Goodwin is going to be a good look for them. Got a huge reputation, Simon Goodwin. He does. I believe uh, one of the most uh, qualified and credentialed people in the business. Just needs to park his aspirations over for two years, Darcy. It's just a simple fact. All right. Geelong's uh, third quarter performance, Dan. We have to take uh, a look at that and pay some massive respect. So down by 23 points. Look who steps up. There's the first bounce. Selwood, he just had a look in his eyes, Damon, and said, there is no way yeah. on my watch this is going to be anything apart from a victory. They were it, just incredible again, the way Stevie J gets involved. Joel Corey got involved. James Kelly had a great quarter. Matty Stokes had a brilliant quarter. Uh, yeah. They're big game players just stepped up again. I mean, the way you catch that, Dars, just under under my watch not happening, there's very few players who can actually will themselves for that to yeah. be the outcome, isn't there? And, and he's one of them. And we touched on Dan Hanabry before. He's in that bracket as well, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, it's a special quality, isn't it, to just know that uh, when it's needed, you've yep. got something in the take. Bartel's done it before so many times on the big stage. One of the most impressive uh, quarters. They were playing horrible footy before that. Mm. Very few teams have got the ability just to flick a switch and do it. There's the numbers. Stokes... 14 possessions. Selwood and Kelly were both, I thought, the players that changed it around with their efforts. Stevie J really stepped up. Really well coached too. I thought what Chris Scott did at half-time, changed their forward structure yep. around, got their gun players around the footy and they did the rest. Now, you just highlighted some midfielders there, Dars, or, or running players. I know you really want to get to the core of what you believe was the reason for Geelong's turnaround. This man, Nathan. Bain. I love him, Damo. I absolutely love him. He's had uh, injury issues with his hips that were probably going to end his career. Yep. If he gets a good enough run at it, you're looking at, uh, I think, the most talented young Ruckman going around. He just needs a bit of time, but you can just see there he's got the deft touch, he's got the ability to follow up, he's athletic. Started to take a couple of grabs, Damo, as well in this game at big moments when they really needed him. He can go forward and kick goals. He's the one. He's the one that I would love to just spend some time with. And I'm not saying me, I'm just saying if you had a, if you had yep. a club that you could build around a young Ruckman. He's an man. Oh, he's an absolute ripper. Yep. And he's got a massive job this week. He comes up against uh, Bailey, Hale and Roughhead. So for Geelong are to pull off this big victory, a lot rests on young Nathan Barty's shoulders. Now, you speak about Geelong. They're playing Hawthorne, as we've said. Um, if they were to, to fall short of another grand final... Would they be underachievers, Dars, of the highest order? I know they're hard to win. Premierships are yeah. extremely hard to win. Like North Melbourne only won two under the Carey yeah. era, but 2008 flag and nothing since. 
You'd have to say that. I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves uh, that they A, get through and B, uh, don't win on grand final day. But with that list and that quality, uh, the home and away wins they've had this year, they're the most talented list in the game. When you've got that, you would feel that another, another grand final is something that they probably should achieve as a yep. pass mark, which is a pretty hard thing to say. I admire how they've just got themselves back up there again, yep. but they need another premiership, don't they, for all of them to feel satisfied with what they've yep. got. Hey, Dust, last week you were very critical, and I, I believe, I feel rightly so, on Dustin Martin for his jailhouse salute last week, but he didn't take too kindly to it during the week. Well, it's good to know Dusty's uh, uh, watching for a start, which is great. And I, I love Dustin, believe me, as a player. I think he's an absolute ripper. And, I, and uh, I'm not taking that negatively. Luke Dusty, he's a Larry. What's, what's, I, I'd be taking it negatively, Dusty. Why would you do that, Dave? Any think, number of reasons. I, probably one word I can use there to describe Larry would be tosser. Uh, well, it's funny. We actually looked it up, Damo, and it's loving, wonderful and kind. And, uh, and, I, and I feel the same about you, Dustin, if that's the case. <laughs> you want to read that second line? Uh, very sexy and wild in bed, Dustin. He's done his research and... Uh, and accurately... No, no, uh, stick with Tosser, Dust. You that's, think so? That's, what you that's where Dustin's coming from. Probably is, let's be honest. Hey, yeah, there was an incident I loved on the weekend and a runner get in, got involved. And normally I would be critical of this too, yeah. but when the runner is Nigel Lappin, who is one of the all-time greats, Nigel, triple premiership hero, he's just forgotten he's out there. <laughs> he says, all right, uh, Alan Christensen, high five for you. You deserve it. Great stuff from uh, Nigel Lappin. I reckon nice you, you play a grand final with a broken rib. You're allowed to do whatever you want you later. You can do to... anything you like. Nigel's an absolute superstar. Thank you, Damo. That's it for another edition of Access Hilarious. We'll be back next Monday. Enjoy the prelim finals. Can't wait for them this weekend. We'll see you soon.